Hello again. Welcome back. Lecture 9-2. Um, so still talking about language, um, but now we've been learning a little bit more about how language abilities develop uh, in the young child. So this is our first real connection with developmental psychology. You'll, you'll remember we skipped a chapter early on uh, in this course, and that chapter was focused on developmental psychology. Generally speaking, um, and, and let's just go to the title slide here. Boom. There we go. Generally speaking, developmental psychology focuses on how certain abilities develop or devolve, <laughs> change during the lifespan. That's a better way to think about it. So we can think about the, the young child that becomes, you know, the infant that becomes the child, that becomes the, the adolescent, that becomes the adult. And we can ask questions about how they're um, psychological world is developing, how it's changing. And, and that's what we'll be talking about here, especially with respect to language, how language abilities are developing. But let me be clear that developmental psychology also focuses on the other end of the continuum um, as people age and they start to lose certain cognitive abilities. Um, sometimes we're interested in studying that too, things like memory deterioration, um, you know, issues of that sort that occur more later in life. And so generally speaking, developmental psychology looks looks at changes in some psychologically relevant thing over time. And in this case, we're going to look at the development from, you know, really an inability to use language to the point of being able to use language fluently. Okay, and there's a few issues we're going to run across here. So first of all, let's just give you the initial story. And there's some really interesting kind of things that happen interest early on. So first of all, um, which says here, infants can distinguish between speech and non-speech sounds as early as nine months old. So there's, there's even some stuff to talk about before this point. Before the child is even born, it learns its mother's voice especially, and its father's voice. Now, its mother's voice, of course, it is within the mother. So it's feeling the reverberation that our bodies make every time we speak. So it's getting to know the mother's voice. But it's also hearing the father and the other family members, you know, th through, the, <laughs> through the actual body of the mother. And we know that it can um, get to learn those, those voices because right after birth, an infant will orient more towards the, the sound of its father's voice than it will towards some other male, say the doctor in the room or whatever it may be. Um, it seems to know who its family members are from the moment of birth. It, it has learned that during the whole period of, of being carried. Um, but certainly, after it's born, and it's been in this world for nine months, it knows the difference between sounds that are language-carrying and, and ones that are not. Um, and it's more interested in the sounds that carry language information. So it shows um, an interest in those sounds over other sounds um, at nine months already. Um, now, there's an interesting thing that happens sort of between birth and some of these, these periods. Um, it turns out that some of our languages um, don't stress certain distinctions, but other languages do. So I mentioned this, like the LR distinction in, in Japanese children. In the Japanese language, the way those letters are voiced is, is very similar, the L's and the R's. Um, and so they don't really need to hear that distinction, that little er, that, that little thing. It's not important in their language. They don't use it. What you would find is if, if you had a very young Chinese baby and you could test it, and there are ways of testing, I won't get into all the details, but not long after birth, it will hear that difference between an L and an R. But because that difference isn't important in its language, then later it loses the ability to hear that distinction. So we, we only stay sensitive to the sound distinctions that matter in our language. Uh, and that is why, by the way, so, so an older Chi Japanese person, sorry, who has learned to speak English sometimes mixes up those L's and R's. They still have trouble hearing the difference between those two because it's not a difference important in their language. Um, so, so it's like a child is born ready to learn any language. But then once it's in a language context, it really learns the sound distinctions that are important to that language. Um, so, so it kind of zones in over time and actually loses some ability to discriminate sounds because those sounds aren't important. Just kind of an interesting process that happens there. Um, <clears throat> 
by about eight to 10 months, they start to understand some words um, and, and some simple requests, um, you know, very, very like, no kind of no is the classic one babies hate that word when they when they come into contact with it uh and and around from from four to ten months somewhere and and you notice these are wide ranges and that's because every baby is quite different um and so there's a lot of variability but somewhere in the four to ten months they babble and by ten months they start using simple words okay i want to show you a, a video of this babbling thing because it's just too cool not to show you. Um, and But it also highlights a few things. So I'm not going to say a whole lot. Let's just watch it first and then go from there. I'm going to stop it for a second. You get the sense. Um, I, I want you to watch some more, but I want to make a few few points here. So first of all, they're not using words, <laughs> right? This is Babel, classic Babel. Da, 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 ba, 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 ba. But in their Babel, you you already sense grammatical structure, like questions, ba, ba, da, ba, ba. Like a question was asked, and the other one's like, ba, ba, and sort of an, a response to that. This is them mimicking what they have heard, right? And by the way, how old are these guys? Well, they're standing on their own, so they're probably in that 10-month to 12-month sort of, you know, maybe a little more age, but they're right at sort of this this age. So they've been exposed to language. They're doing things like turn-taking, one person babbles, then the other babbles, back and forth, you know, which is an important part of human language. And what this is really showing is how much of the syntax and grammar and the sort of way of using language they have learned before they've even learned any words. Okay, so let's, and, and of course, somebody's put those silly words on there just to make it fun. Um, let's watch a bit more. Okay, so this can go on and on and on and on, and we don't need the whole details of it. Um, but but, but it, again, it really shows all of those. There's so much to language. It's not just about the words. It's about the way we interact with each other. Language is a really big ritual of interaction between two or more individuals where we take turns sharing knowledge with each other and where we voice things in a certain way, like I just voice them in a certain way. You know, we, we add emphasis to certain things to try to make the language interesting. And you see they're doing that too, right? So they're using, you know, sometimes it's yeah, da, 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 yeah, da, da. <laughs> so they're using sound, they're using volume changes, they're doing whatever, you know, to try to make it kind of interesting and neat. Okay, I think, you know, that that's, says enough. We don't need to dwell on that too much. Um, but that's, that's an example of babies, so they're twins, obviously, babies that are at that stage where they've been surrounded by language, where they're kind of absorbing the structure of it and the rituals of it, and they still haven't really figured out what the words mean. Um, and it's really around 10 months where they're going to start learning these words and then being able to use the words within that structure. If we kind of look at how the development goes in a longer term here, we'll come to this figure on the right in a moment, but these are, these are some of the things. So by the way, average age of attainment in months, one and a half months, this one and a half months, <laughs> I'm speaking to all you women and, and mothers to be uh, in the audience now, especially with your first child. You may be in for a bit of a shock, uh, a tough shock, uh, because society has all these beautiful images of mothers, especially with their first child. And what many, many mothers find is that first month and a half or two months of being a new mother is shocking. Um, it's shocking in a number of ways. One is you are removed from your normal 
social context. Um, you know, if you're a working person or whatever, suddenly you're not. You're home, you're alone, you're disconnected from others, and you have this baby that needs you constantly, um, that requires your attention constantly. Your life changes boom, really, really, really quickly. And this baby always needs stuff. It needs to be fed. It needs to be changed. It's not happy because it hasn't slept well, blah, blah, blah. And you're continually trying to make this baby happy. And what makes it especially hard is during that first month or two, the baby doesn't tend to give back very much. Um, it just wants, 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 wants. Uh, somewhere around a month and a half, something really important happens. The baby starts socially responding. Now, now in the baby's defense, for example, in the first few weeks, it can't even see the world very well. You know, all of its perceptual systems are developing, and it takes it about a month and a half to be ready to, to kind of see the social cues, to understand that when the mother is smiling and making certain things, that certain sounds, that that's trying to make the baby happy. And at this point, the baby will start to smile back, will start to coo, will start to, you know, look back into the eyes and, and respond in that, in that sort of emotionally connected way. And that's really, really important to mothers. When that happens, now suddenly the baby feels more like that baby they thought they were going to have. So you, you've been warned, mothers, <laughs> that first month and a half or two months is tricky, but it does, you know, it does get better. Um, when we look at language abilities, you know, this is the beginning of language. So the beginning of the language is the notion of being emotionally responsive to the person you're connecting with. You have to, to have good language, you have to be attending to somebody and you have to be emotionally responsive. And we're going to talk about that uh, in a few lectures. Um, but when we start thinking more like the words part, well, by about six months, they start to babble. And you just saw babbling um, in, in its full form there. And they're experimenting with vocal sounds, right? Blah, 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 etc. Um, inhibits to know. So this is, this is you know, typically the first <laughs> word uh, children learn. They don't like learning it because it usually means they're up to something that they're not supposed to be. Um, grabbing hair or something like that. And the mother will say, no, no. Um, and eventually it learns that no means stop doing what you're doing. Uh, and this means it's really starting to hear the sound of that word. It says response to tone there. It's really hearing that word and getting a basic understanding of that word. Um, follows one step commands when said with a gesture. Stop. Stop. Or, or food. Eat, eat your food. Um, things like that. So by about seven months, it can start to kind of get, you know, one word, um, eat, I guess it would be not eat your food, eat, um, things like that. And we typically do use the gestures. We just sort of automatically do that. Um, and so by seven months, it can start to understand that. Um, by 10 months, start to understand one step verbal command when said without a gesture. So you can just use your language and, and the baby can start to understand these one word commands. Um, by about 10 months, it starts expressing itself for the first time. Um, and usually, you know, there's a base, is it going to say mama? Is it going to say dada, etc.? So it starts to use its first word sometime around 10 months. Um, and it may even point to objects. It may say car, toy car, or doll, or, or whatever. And so it's starting to associate words with, with objects and, and maybe even, you know, objects in the environment that's connecting. Um, really starts speaking around a year. Um, oops. Speaks four to six wor words um, by about 15 months. And then it just starts taking off, okay? Um, speaks 15 to 20, 10 to 15 words by about 18. Um, starts to use two word sentences. Um, drink juice, stuff like that, um, as it's getting closer to a year and a half, two years old. Um, maybe 50 word vocabulary overall um, going on here. So this is, this is how we're seeing it kind of start.
Now, where does it take off from there? If we look at the vocabulary, we see it does take off, you know, from about a year and a half, then it just sort of takes off. But here is where, you know, just to give you a sense of some of the psychology coming into play, I've shown you here a graph of how quickly a child's vocabulary takes off as a function of whether its parents are professionals, working class, or welfare parents. And what do you see? The environment matters. Um, why? Why would this be the case? Well, first of all, we can kind of imagine that along this line is also something we call socioeconomic status. How much money does the family have? Professional parents probably have more money. So generally speaking, we can imagine that the that, that children in the professional parent household are, are in a richer, literally, household that might have you know, maybe more access to language, but not necessarily. What it probably is a reflection of is two things. One, maybe how much attention that the parent or somebody else is paying to the child. Professional parents, they might have hired nannies or whatever. Um, versus, you know, working class parents, it might be harder to spend as much time with the children. And a lot of welfare parents are working jobs in addition to the welfare. And it may be just hard for them to spend as much time. So maybe the parents don't speak with the children as much. Um, but also there's the question of what is the vocabulary of the parents? And so people who've, you know, been through formal education and such probably have a richer vocabulary themselves. And so these children are surrounded by people who are using more complex language. Uh, and they are developing their language abilities to a larger extent. This is the argument for reading to children. You know, wh whatever your, your socioeconomic status may be, read to young children, expose them to language, and expose them to relatively complex language. Um, and, and, you know, especially if they get into reading themselves, that's fantastic. That builds their language skills. Okay. All right. One other piece of this puzzle that we want to talk about, and again, it's a bit of a sad story. Um, and it's a story around um, a child named Jeannie. Jeannie was a child who was discovered um, in a closet, literally. Uh, there, were, there were parents, uh, it's hard to call them parents, uh, who had Jeannie, but for whatever reason, told nobody that they had a child, um, left Jeannie locked in a closet all the time. She had no stimulation. You know, they, they gave her food and water. They took care of her waist. But otherwise, she was alone in a dark room uh, for many, many years. I believe around 11 years or, or something like that, 8 to 11 years, something like that. She was eventually discovered. Um, and so there was a sort of an, an interesting question with Jeannie that when she was discovered, she could not speak any language um, because she had not been exposed to language. Um, and so the question is, well, we know a normal child, you know, they start using language at around a year and within about a year and a half or two, they're pretty darn proficient. So if we start with Jeannie now, um, and let's call her a 10-year-old. I should know how old she is, but let's say she's 10. You know, if we start teaching her language at 10, shouldn't she be just as good by 12 and a half as, as, a, as a child would be? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, Jeannie found it very, very hard to learn language. And this started people thinking um, of this idea of what we start to call now a critical period, that maybe there's a certain time, like when you're about a year old, maybe your brain is really ready to learn language. And if it's exposed to language at that period, then it's really able to kind of learn and grow. But if you miss that window, if you miss that critical period like you did with Jeannie, then maybe it gets a lot harder to learn language. Um, this sort of notion of a critical period applies well to second language learners. And many of you guys can, can relate this to situations in your family uh, directly. Um, if we look at a native language speaker and we know how proficient they are and now we talk we talk um, about second language so it's people who've learned that same language as their second language and we ask well when did they learn it if they learned that language when they were three to seven years old then they tend to be just as fluent as a native speaker um, you know they're really ready to learn that language and they learn it just as well as someone who learned it as their very first language but if they don't learn the second language until they're 8 to 10, they can still do pretty well, but never quite as good as, as if they'd learned to learn younger. 
If they're 11 to 15, harder still. If they're 17 to 39, harder still. If they're 39 and above, you know, and so this is why so often we will see um, immigrant families come, like my family. Um, immigrant families will come and the children will very quickly learn the language, especially if they come when they're young, and they will be able to very quickly enculturate themselves with, with that new culture. The older people find it much, much harder. If they didn't know that language, if they hadn't learned it when they were young, they find it much, much harder to ever learn that language, even after decades of being you know, in that new language context. It's just like they've missed that critical period and now learning the language is very difficult. And so we often have youngsters in these families that are very good at the language and older people who are you know, very good at their native language but still struggling with the, with the new language. Um, and so you know, this notion of a critical period for language development has now got a lot of evidence to support it. Um, and, and we wonder sometimes whether there aren't critical periods for other kinds of development as well uh, and in the development part you would learn uh, more about that by the way i should just end by saying we skipped that development chapter <laughs> we skipped it for a reason and that's because the the professor that teaches psych ao2 uh, is a developmental psychologist uh, and so it makes more sense for him to teach that chapter so kyle danielson so should you be interested in what you've been learning about development consider taking psych ao2 you'll learn about it there right from kyle and he'll give you much more of the the full details okay i'm going to leave the the development of language here for now um, and i will see you in the next lecture bye bye